I'm the Patrick J. McGovern Professor of Management at the MIT Sloan School of Management and Director of the Center for Coordination Science. Those are my current titles. By the way, you want me looking at the camera or at you? Ignore it. Look at me. Okay. Um, what, what's, what's your background? What sort of work do you do? Um, I, um, I'm the author of the book, The Future of Work, and uh, have, was director of a research initiative at MIT called Inventing the Organizations of the 21st Century. I've been um, uh, doing research on how information technology changes the ways organizations can work for over two decades. Um, do you want even more background than that? Yeah, well, uh, tell us about how work is going to be in the future. What do you think? Well, I have a, um, an elevator speech answer to that. I think we're in the early stages of an increase in human freedom in business that may, in the long run, be as important a change for business as the change to democracies was for governments. The reason I think that's happening is because it's now possible for the first time in human history to have the economic benefits of very large organizations and at the same time to have the human benefits of very small organizations. Things like freedom, flexibility, motivation, and creativity. And the reason that's possible is because a new generation of information technologies, email, the World Wide Web, cheap long distance, and everything associated with the Internet, those technologies are reducing the costs of communication to such a low level that it's now possible for huge numbers of people, even in very large organizations, to have enough information that they can make sensible decisions for themselves instead of just following orders from someone above them in a hierarchy who supposedly knows more than they do. So it's the technology that makes this possible, but just because something's possible doesn't mean it will necessarily happen or even that it's necessarily desirable. But it turns out that there are a bunch of good things that happen when people are making decisions for themselves instead of following orders. For one thing, they're often more motivated, they're often more creative, they're able to be more flexible and change what they do to their own situation instead of just following rigid rules. And finally, often, they just plain like it better. Now, those benefits of decentralized decision making aren't important everywhere, but in our increasingly knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy, the critical factors for business success are often precisely the same things as the benefits of decentralized decision making. Motivation, creativity, innovation, and fun. So that's why I think that even though it won't happen everywhere, this more decentralized way of making decisions will become much more common in many more parts of our economy over the coming decades. Where, where is this already happening? Well, uh, it's already happening in uh, some industries more than others. Uh, High-tech industry has more decentralized decision-making. Um, one of my favorite examples is eBay. Um, eBay uh, has over 56 million active buyers and sellers, but of those, about 430,000 are people who say they make their primary living from selling on eBay. Now, if those people were actually employees of eBay, that alone would make eBay about the second largest private employer in the country, behind Walmart but ahead of McDonald's. But the thing is, they're not employees. They're essentially independent store owners. And as independent store owners, they have a huge amount of freedom deciding what to sell, when to sell it, how to advertise it, how to price it. All the freedom that any small store owner would have, but coupled with that freedom, is a scale that would have been unimaginable to any small store owner in history. Because these eBay sellers can sell into a national, and in many cases, global marketplace. So we're already seeing it in places like eBay. What are some other sectors that, that will probably see more of this decentralized decision making in the future? Well, in general, the, the places we should see this m faster and more are the places where the benefits of decentralized decision making are most important things like motivation, creativity, and innovation. So some industries, like high-tech, are more likely to do this sooner than others.
some business functions like design and engineering and uh, a lot of creative things like uh, writing, journalism, etc. Um, uh, wherever knowledge workers and the exer their exercise of creativity are important, those are places we should expect to see this. Is, is blogging an example of this? Sure. Blogging is one of many things, many examples of uh, how people can share information more widely in a very decentralized way. I mean, blogging alone is an example of the technology that enables this. But um, I actually, in my book, use blogging at Google as an example of this. Google was one of the first companies to explicitly say their employees could have blogs about their work. And so a lot of Google employees, as I understand it, have blogs about what they're doing day to day on their projects, which the people in other projects can read. So that increases the amount of coordination that can go on in a very lateral, decentralized way directly between the different project groups without requiring centralized coordination from a higher level manager. What are some of the downsides of this of decentralized decision making? What are some examples of some sectors where it doesn't work? Well, it's hard to say sectors where it doesn't work because in general the the choice of whether you want to do this decentralized decision making is in part a strategic choice. Two different companies in exactly the same industry could make different choices about the degree to which they want to rely on innovation and creativity and motivation for their, their competitive advantage. They b might both be successful, but one should make heavier use of this decentralized decision making to achieve their strategic objectives, the other shouldn't. But in general, the disadvantages of decentralized decision making are things like uh, sometimes it's more expensive and takes longer to make decisions when it's being made in a decentralized way. That's not always true. It depends on how you're doing it. Uh, but that's sometimes a problem. Uh, it's sometimes harder to control risk and quality when lots of people are making decentralized decisions. Uh, sometimes harder to take advantage of economies of scale when people are doing more decentralized decision making. But in all these cases I say sometimes because we often assume it's impossible to do those things in a decentralized environment. But in many cases, it's not impossible. It just requires a little creativity to think about how to do it. What haven't we talked about that is important? Uh, one other thing I think is important is that, that I talk about in my book, is that I think the same information technologies that make markets more efficient in terms of prices and products and so forth are also going to make markets more efficient in terms of values, a broader range of human values than the strictly economic ones. My favorite example of that is a company called Ideals Work that um, has a website where they have a lot of different product categories for things like appliances and athletic footwear and so forth and the vendors for those different kinds of products rated according to how well they perform on a variety of different uh, dimensions that are important to people from a social or, or other point of view, not just from an economic point of view. For instance, things like um, uh, how well uh, the company treats the environment and how well they treat workers in developing countries and women's rights and, and so forth, animal rights, whatever. So you can go to that website and pick the values that are important to you and then see a ranking of the vendors of the product category that you're interested in in terms of whatever values you said were important to you. Now today uh, the values on that website in particular are mostly what you might think of as liberal values but there's no reason why you couldn't do the same sort of thing either there or somewhere else for conservative values or Catholic values or Buddhist values or gun owner values or any kind of value system you can think. And the, the point is the technology makes it easier if you care about those things to find out about which companies support or embody the same values that are, as those that are important to you. Not everyone cares. Not everyone will make important buying decisions or 
decisions about where to invest or where to work on those bases. But I believe some people, probably a lot more than we think, really do care about those things to some degree. And if the information were easily available, would take those things into account much more than they do today in making their economic decisions. So what I think that means is that increasingly companies will be competing in a marketplace not just for products and prices, but a marketplace for values. And I think that gives us as a society an opportunity to shape the, the way our society evolves by our taking into account non-economic values in making our economic choices. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay.